Uh, yes, today, as Jules said, I am bringing the next installment in our series on looking at who Jesus is. And it's been great so far, hasn't it? We have seen Jesus described as the Messiah, the long-awaited saviour of Israel, the Lord and the King, the almighty ruler who has authority over all things, and the Son, who in relationship with the Father is God himself. And it's as if each week we have been climbing a different mountain to discover the depth of who Jesus is. At the top of each peak, we see yet another side to the vast beauty of the person of Jesus. And today, we're going to be looking at another one of these titles, the Alpha and the Omega. We're going to be climbing a mountain which is shrouded in mystery. And as we climb today, we're going to be delving into things which are hard to understand. We're going to be aiming to imagine the unimaginable and to fathom the unfathomable. And it might seem like an impossible task ahead of us, but it's actually in this mystery that we see the glory and the majesty of Jesus, the eternal God. So what does it mean that Jesus is the Alpha and the Omega? It means that Jesus is the first and the last. He is the beginning and the end. This is the same as if we were to say uh, A to Z. This is the first and the last letters of the Greek language. And so we're going to start at the beginning. It seems like the best place to start. And so Jesus is the beginning. The Bible starts, Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And we see exactly this same start in John's biography of Jesus' life. In John 1, he writes, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him, all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. So John calls Jesus here the word of God, and he tells his readers that Jesus was there right at the beginning. Before anything was created, before a single atom or molecule was formed, Jesus was. Before time began, Jesus was. Literally everything that we see, everything that we know about, matter, space, time, came into existence. But not Jesus. I told you that we were going to be heading into the mist as we climb today. But before we fear getting lost and straying from the path, what can we see in this? What do we have to illuminate our way? Well, Jesus is outside of time. Before time began, he existed. He is the constant. He is the ultimate reality. As John says, Jesus was not only with God in the beginning, but he was God. And there, with his Father, at the beginning of all things, everything was made through him. John says in verse 3, doesn't he? Without him, nothing was made that has been made. Jesus was with his Father in the creation process, and through him, everything was made. I want us to just pause and consider that for a moment. Nothing would exist without Jesus. Jesus is the source of all life. And what we see through John's opening verses as he sets up the rest of his gospel is the uniqueness, the divinity of Jesus. He is the uncreated eternal son who with the father created all things. We see this backed up. In Paul's letter to the Colossians, chapter 1, verses 15 to 17, it says, The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things. And in him, all things hold together. In just these three verses, we see the unity of these titles of Jesus that we've been looking at. Jesus the Son, Jesus the Lord and the King, and here Jesus the Alpha and the Omega. This is Jesus. 
There are aspects of his character which are a mystery, an unreachable summit on our discovery of who Jesus is, but it's actually what makes him glorious. This is what makes him God. If we could understand everything there was to understand about him, then he would be no God at all. He would be created in our minds. But Jesus was not created. He is the uncreated, eternal God. Jesus is the Alpha. He is the Word at the beginning. But as our title says today, he's also the Omega. He is the end. And to discover what that means, I'd like us to turn to the end of John's writing. We've seen this description of Jesus as the Word at the beginning at the start of his gospel. And towards the end of his vision in Revelation, we see John use this same title, the Word of God, in Revelation 19, as he describes how Jesus will return to judge the world. Jesus is not only the beginning, but he is the end. He's the culmination of all things. Through his vision in Revelation, John sees what will happen at the end of the age. Like a woman in childbirth, there will be a series of labor pains before Jesus returns in glory. John describes what will happen after Jesus' return. And in both chapters 21 and 22 of Revelation, we see Jesus described as the Alpha and the Omega. John describes how Jesus is going to make everything new. One day when he returns, he will make a new heaven and a new earth where there will be no sickness, no suffering, no death. Where he will rule from his throne with power and authority. He is the end of all things. And in Revelation 21 verse 6, Jesus says to John, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. It is is done. I want us to briefly think of two other moments in the Bible where we hear this message of completion before we consider what Jesus is saying in this verse. As we've seen, Jesus is the Alpha, the one who through all things were created. And after this work of creation in Genesis 2, chapter one, uh, 2 verse 1, we read, so the creation of the heavens and the earth and everything in them was completed. At this point, creation was completed. It was done. Fast forward all the way to John chapter 19. We see Jesus, the Alpha and the Omega, hanging on the cross. With his final words, he said, it is finished. With that, he bowed his head and he gave up his spirit. At this moment, Jesus declared that his work on the cross was finished bearing the weight of all of our sin. As he breathed his last, he said, it is finished, it is done. And now we come back to Revelation 21. As John sees what is to come, a new heaven and a new earth, an age where all who have put their, when, where all have put their trust in Jesus will live in community with God. Jesus says, I am making all things new. It is done. This is the end. There will be no sequel. There will be no encore. We see completion in creation. We see completion at the cross and we see that one day when the Alpha and the Omega returns, we'll see the completion of all things. Eden will be restored. What was broken in the first garden will be made new. And this is the hope of all who put their trust in Jesus the hope of eternity in relationship with God through him. One day he will return at the end of all things. And it's to this return that I'd like us to now consider. In the following chapter, in the final pages of our Bibles, Jesus speaks three times of his return. I'm going to read Revelation 22, 12 and 13. He says, look, I am coming soon. My reward is with me and I'll give to each person according to what they've done. I am the Alpha and the Omega. The first and the last, the beginning and the end. Jesus says not only is he coming back, but he's coming soon. Soon. In other versions, this is translated quickly. What does it mean that he is coming soon? 
I reckon we've probably all had that moment where you're running late and you're supposed to be meeting a friend and it gets to about the time that you're supposed to be actually meeting them. So you send them a text to say, I'll, I'll be there soon. What you haven't actually told them is that you haven't left the house yet, but you will be there soon-ish. Um, now, however bad our timekeeping, we will get there soon. And Jesus says that he's coming soon, but can you really say that and 2,000 years later have not shown up yet? Well, Peter writes in his second letter, chapter 3, that some will say, where is this coming, he promised. Ever since our ancestors died, every, everything goes on as it has since the beginning of creation. But he goes on to say in verse 8, but do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Jesus is the eternal God, the ageless one. To him, a thousand years is like a day, and he says he is coming soon. So what is our response to this? Where can we look to find an answer? Well, Jesus, anticipating this question, gives us clear instruction as to what we should do, what this should provoke in us. In Luke chapter 12, Jesus is speaking to a large crowd. He's telling them what is really valuable in this life. And then in verse 35, his attention turns to the posture in which his followers should take as they consider him coming back. If you'd like to take your Bibles and open them to Luke 12, we're going to read verses 35 to 40. Jesus says, Be dressed, ready for service, and keep your lamps burning. Like servants waiting for their master to return from a wedding banquet, so that when he comes and knocks, they can immediately open the door for him. It'll be good for those servants whose master finds them watching when he comes. Truly, I tell you, he will dress himself to serve, will have them recline at the table, and will come and wait on them. It will be good for those servants whose master finds them ready, even if he comes in the middle of the night or towards daybreak. But understand this, if the owner of the house had known what hour the thief was coming, he would have not let his house to be broken into. You also must be ready, because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. Jesus wants us to be ready, to be expectant and waiting, like a child peering through the curtains, waiting for their loved one to return. Psalm 130 talks of waiting for the Lord more than a watchman waits for the morning. I just love that image. Imagine being stood high on a watchtower. Your job is to keep watch uh, for anyone approaching your city, and it's your turn on night watch. As you look out into the night sky, trying to keep your eyes open hour after hour, there is one thing that you are looking for above anything else. One thing that you are counting down the minutes to see as you look east. And then you see it. The sun begins to creep into view on the horizon. And you know that your shift is done. The hours of trying to keep watch are over. It has arrived. Even more so than that, the psalmist says, are those who wait for the Lord. Are we waiting for Jesus' return in this way? Keeping watch with eager expectation. But, you know, does this mean that we stand around looking up into the sky, waiting to see Jesus coming on the clouds, riding a white horse? Well, no. With Jesus' return on our minds, we should be urgent in our service to him. Jesus says in the parable, be dressed ready for service. Keep your lamps burning. We're not called to sit around waiting for him to show up. We are called to live with an expectancy and an urgency of our returning Lord. He has given us a job to do. And Jesus shows this in the the parable of the talents. In this story, Jesus says that a master was going on a trip. He was going to be away a while. While he was away, he gave three of his servants his wealth and told, told them to steward it well. When he returns, he finds that two of his servants have invested well. They've made a good return. But the third servant had hidden his master's wealth and had nothing to show when the master returned. Through this story, Jesus was showing his disciples and us today that we are called to invest in what we've been given. What is it that God has given you 
to use for his kingdom. To invest in things that last. No matter how old we are, no matter what our scenario, Jesus is calling us to live with an urgency and an expectation to invest our lives in his kingdom. I wonder if you've got a bucket list. Things that you want to do, sights you want to see, experiences that you want to have before you die. Maybe it's learning a new language. Maybe it's seeing certain sights. Whatever it is, if you knew you just had 24 hours left to live, what would you do with your time? What, what would you do? The answer to this question gives us a, a clue to what we value most in life. Or as the Bible puts it, where our treasure is. How would we spend those final few hours if we knew they were our last? We don't know the exact time of Jesus' coming, or our death for that matter. But Jesus is calling us to live like our time is short and to invest well. David writes in Psalm 39, Show me, Lord, my life's end and the number of my days. Let me know how fleeting my life is. You have made my days a mere handbreadth. The span of my years is nothing before you. Everyone is but a breath, even those who seem secure. David isn't asking for a morbid obsession with death, but he recognizes the eternal nature of God's sovereignty brings new perspective to life. Our life is but a breath, even those who seem secure. But Jesus is the eternal God, the one whose days cannot be numbered. The one who is the booth, the beginning and the end. Lord, will you teach us to number our days? Help us to live with a recognition of our short time here in light of your eternal nature. To live like our time is short is not a call to seek earthly pleasures as those who consider how many things they can tick off their bucket list. But it's an invitation to invest in treasure that never fades. This is what we're called to do as followers of Jesus. He is the one who is coming back. Whose return is soon. And he's calling us to serve with urgency and live with expectation of this return. But right now we're in the middle, right? Jesus is both the beginning and the end, the start and the conclusion. But what does that mean for us right here in the middle? To see this, I'd like us to turn to the, the other place where it describes Jesus as the Alpha and the Omega. Revelation chapter 1 verse 8 says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. Here we are introduced to a new way of describing the Alpha and the Omega. Instead of the first and the last, the beginning and the end as we've seen in our other passages, this title is followed with who is and who was and who is to come. But do you notice anything odd about that? Have a look at the order. The one who is, and who was, and who is to come. It's in an unusual order, right? I think it would be reasonable to expect that we would see it in chronological order. The one who was, the one who is, the one who is to come. But that's not what we see. We read the Alpha and the Omega described first and foremost as the one who is. Jesus is the one who is. He isn't a distant God. He isn't just in the distant past or in the far off future, but he is the one who is now. Jesus is. And I believe this should be an encouragement to us. Unlike the master who left his servants to invest his wealth before he returned, Jesus has not left us alone. He has sent his spirit to dwell in us. Right now, he is. He is sitting at the right hand of his Father, interceding for us. Jesus, the Eternal One, is present among us. He is our ever-present help in time of trouble, in this moment and this moment. Wherever we find ourselves, whatever we find ourselves doing, he is. He is constant. So as we consider how to use our life, what to invest in, we need to keep in mind that we're not doing this alone. 
we have Jesus, the eternal God, who is right here with us by his spirit. The one who is and was and is to come. Let's take stock for a moment as we consider drawing things to a close this morning. Today we have set out on a mysterious mountain, a peak which is shrouded in mystery. And although it's difficult to fully grasp the weight of the eternal nature of Jesus, let's consider what we have seen today. Jesus is both the beginning and the end. He is the one through whom all things were made. And he's the one who is going to return. Jesus is the eternal God. He always has been and he always will be. Hebrews 13.8 says, Jesus is the same yesterday, today and forever. This is what theologians call the immutable nature of God. And it's basically just a fancy way of saying that he never changes. He is constant. No matter what happens, no matter how long passes, Jesus is the same. So what is our response to him today? I believe there could be three potential responses as we consider Jesus, the first and the last, as we consider his coming to us soon. Firstly, with his return in our view, what sort of people are we called to be? What are we called to be like? Peter, in uh, chapter 3 of his second letter, answers this very question. He says, what kind of people ought we be? He goes on to say, you ought to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of God and speed its coming. That day will bring about the destruction of the heavens by fire and the elements will will melt in the heat. But in keeping with this promise, we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth where righteousness dwells. So then, dear friends, since you are looking forward to this, make every effort to be found spotless, blameless, and at peace with him. We are called to be holy, to turn from the things that do not bring God glory. I wonder, what is it that we need to repent of this morning? We heard it mentioned at the end of our worship this morning. The need for repentance, the need to recognize where we've been going our own way. Where we've put things before God. What is it that we need to, to give to him and to turn from? What areas of life do we need to acknowledge that we have been going in our own way, indulging in the things of this world. I want us to just spend a moment of quiet now. Perhaps you'd close your eyes if you feel comfortable. Just before God, this is between you and God. Are there areas of your life that God is calling you to repent of this morning, to turn back to him? We've heard Jesus and God described as the compassionate one, the one who is slow to anger, the faithful one. We can come to him knowing he welcomes us with open arms. Father, I thank you for your grace to us. I thank you that we can give everything to you knowing that you are in control, knowing that you're faithful, knowing that you're compassionate. And Lord, we want to turn from the things that are not of you and run the race that you've marked out for us. Give us faith to do that. Give us boldness, perseverance, hope. Amen. The second thing that I believe that we may be called to do today is to invest. In the light of Jesus' soon return, we're called to invest wisely, to store up those treasures in heaven. But what has God given you to invest? Jesus calls us to be ready, to be willing to serve and invest in this kingdom. And he says in Luke 12, "From from everyone who's been given much, 
much will be demanded. And from the one who is entrusted with much, much more will be asked. And we might feel like we don't really have that much to offer. But you know, the reality is that whatever situation we find ourselves living in, we live with more resources than almost anyone in the whole of history. We have the ability to communicate with people all across the world with the thing that we hold in our pockets. We have access to clean running water, something which just a couple of hundred years ago would have been a luxury. And for two billion people here today, one in four people on earth still don't have that basic commodity. We can get in a car or a train or a plane and we can travel anywhere in just a matter of hours. People couldn't have dreamed of that just 150 years ago. Because we have been given much. And where much is given, much is required. This isn't meant to scare you, but we, and I certainly include myself here, we need to assess how we're using what we've been given to serve God, to advance his kingdom. As we wait for Jesus' return, like the watchman waiting for the morning, what do we want him to find us doing when he returns? You know, this is not a matter of just quick, look busy, the boss is coming. This is, this is not putting on a show, but it's in recognition that everything that we have has been given as a gift by his grace. How will we use that for his purposes? Maybe God's calling you to consp- consider how you spend your time. Maybe it's a skill that you know you have and you're not using. Maybe it's connection and relationships that you have with non-Christians that you're being called to witness to. Maybe it's how you use your finances. Whatever it is, are we willing to invest today for what matters forever? Are we willing to invest today for what matters forever? And if you want to invest in his kingdom, to say to God, use me. Everything I have is yours. Then I want to invite you to respond this morning. This is not about anyone else, but just you and God. What I'd like to invite you to do is to just stand and to come to the front and we're just going to pray. If you want to invest today for what matters forever, to invest in his kingdom, I'd like to invite you now, if you're able to stand to your feet and come to the front. This is not about anyone else, just for those who want to do that. I'm just going to pray. As these guys come, I wonder if the band could also come to the front. Lord, you are the faithful one. By your grace, you've given us all that we have. You are the ageless one. Lord, I thank you for each of these guys who've taken that step of faith this morning to say, God, use me. Everything I have is yours. I want to invest it in your kingdom. Lord, I pray for each of these guys. Will you set a fire in their hearts? Will you show them with real clarity what it is that you want to do through them? Lord, will you anoint them with your spirit right now? Fill them to overflowing. get a sense that for some of you who've come to the front, you might feel like you know how God's going to use you, but I feel like he says he wants to surprise you, to open new doors, to, to give you new opportunities that you would never have even possibly imagined. So Father, I want to pray, will you raise our expectation, raise our sights, everything is possible with you, and so we pray, Lord, will you use us to do your work in your way? Lord, help us to invest well. Jesus' name, amen. You guys just stay at the front for just a moment longer. I believe there is just one final response as we consider Jesus the Alpha and the Omega, and that is to worship him, to offer a sacrifice of praise to the Lord of all creation, to the ageless one, to the one who, being outside time, chose to step into time. 
than the creator who chose to join his creation and the one who one day will return to rule and reign with justice and mercy. He is worthy of all praise. He is the eternal God. 